Hi, and welcome to the video on aerobic cellular respiration. If you haven't seen the video on anaerobic cellular respiration, you probably want to watch that first, or at least have a good understanding of those concepts before you watch this video. I don't know who this masked superhero is, but I do know that he's holding his breath. He'll have to be pretty super to be able to hold his breath for more than two or three minutes at a maximum because he's an aerobically respiring organism and he absolutely needs oxygen in order to remain alive. And that's what we're talking about in this video. How do aerobic heterotrophs get energy? In this video, we're going to talk about an overview of aerobic cellular respiration. We're going to talk about the citric acid cycle. We're going to talk about oxidative phosphorylation, and then we're going to compare aerobic cellular respiration with anaerobic cellular respiration. Let's talk about an overview of aerobic cellular respiration first. It's typical when talking about aerobic cellular respiration to focus on glucose as the molecules that we start with. So that's what we're going to do in this video. But it's important to understand that all food molecules that we eat can be used in aerobic cellular respiration to produce energy. Like any respiration, aerobic cellular respiration is an exergonic process that releases free energy into the system that can be used to drive cellular work. In this case, the main cellular work that the free energy is used for is the production of ATP. Looking at oxidation and reduction in this reaction, we can see that the carbon in glucose is what is oxidized, and the oxygen in the oxygen that we breathe in is what is reduced. You don't have to be a eukaryotic organism in order to carry out aerobic cellular respiration, but we're gonna focus on it in eukaryotes because in eukaryotes, it happens in the mitochondria. In order to understand how this works, we're going to need to have some understanding of the anatomy of a mitochondrion. Mitochondria have two different membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The folds of the inner membrane are technically termed the cristae. There's a space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane, the intermembrane space. And of course, there's a space inside of the inner membrane, which is referred to as the mitochondrial matrix. When considering the steps of aerobic cellular respiration, it's good to have a handle on where in the mitochondria these processes occur. The citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix and oxidative phosphorylation occurs on the inner mitochondrial membrane. Remember that even in anaerobic cellular respiration, glycolysis is the first step of the process. Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. Following glycolysis in aerobically respiring organisms, the pyruvate that's produced at the end is going to be transported into the mitochondria, into the mitochondrial matrix to go through the citric acid cycle, also termed the Krebs cycle, before going through oxidative phosphorylation at the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane. But before pyruvate enters the mitochondria, it's converted into a different molecule. It's converted into an acetyl group, a two carbon molecule. In order to carry out this conversion, one of the carbon dioxides from pyruvate is going to be removed and will leave the cell as waste. It's part of what we breathe out when we exhale. We'll also produce an NADH molecule. And as a reminder, we had produced two additional NADH molecules in glycolysis before we ever entered the mitochondria. This acetyl group is then going to be attached to a molecule of coenzyme A. The diagram below shows the molecule of coenzyme A, and I've highlighted the acetyl group in blue so you can see that it's really just a tiny part of the much larger acetyl coenzyme A molecule. It's this acetyl coenzyme A molecule that is going to enter into the mitochondrial matrix and enter into the citric acid cycle. Remember that we get two pyruvates from each glucose in glycolysis. So we're undergoing this conversion and getting these products twice for every glucose that we started with at the beginning of glycolysis. Now that we have acetyl coenzyme A, let's follow it into the mitochondrial matrix and see what happens in the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle is also known as the Krebs cycle because Hans Krebs was a scientist who really elucidated a lot of the mechanisms that we see in the process. Just like with our discussion of glycolysis in our anaerobic cellular respiration video, you do not need to pay attention to it at the level of resolution that is being shown here. That's beyond the level of resolution that I would expect of you in this course. What you do need to pay attention to, as always, are the inputs and the outputs. We're going to put in a molecule of acetyl-CoA and the carbons on that acetyl group are going to be converted into two carbon dioxide molecules. Those carbon dioxide molecules are going to leave the cell as waste. At that point, all of the carbon that we had started with in our original glucose has now been fully oxidized to the point where it exits the cell. We're also going to produce three NADH molecules, so we'll need three NAD plus molecules to enter into the cycle in order to make that happen. 
will produce an additional FADH2 electron shuttle from an FAD molecule, and we will convert one ADP molecule into ATP through substrate level phosphorylation, just like we did in glycolysis. Remember that this is happening times two for every glucose that we started with. At the end of the citric acid cycle, no original carbon from our glucose will remain. It has all been totally oxidized and the electrons from it have been used to produce NADH, FADH2, and we've made some ATP. Let's take a look at the accounting in each step in the process that led up to this point, starting with glycolysis. In glycolysis, we've produced two molecules of NADH and we produced two net molecules of ATP. During the acetyl-CoA conversion, we've produced an additional two molecules of NADH from our original glucose. And in the citric acid cycle, we produced an additional six NADH molecules, two FADH2 molecules, and two ATP molecules. In total, we now have 10 NADH molecules, two FADH2 molecules, and four ATP molecules. Those NADH and FADH2 molecules are storing electrons that we've taken from our initial glucose and the intermediaries that it was converted into. We are now going to feed those NADH and FADH2 electron shuttles into an electron transport chain during oxidative phosphorylation. This, of course, is an example of chemiosmosis. The chemiosmosis that occurs in the mitochondria happens at the mitochondrial inner membrane. It's this inner membrane that has the members of the electron transport chain and ATP synthase. The proton gradient is established between the intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix, with most of the protons being kept in the intermembrane space. The reduced forms of the electron carriers that we produced earlier in the process will arrive at the electron transport chain and donate their electrons to the members of the chain, resuming their oxidized forms. These electrons will flow through the chain until they arrive at the terminal electron acceptor in aerobic cellular respiration, which is oxygen. The reduction of oxygen by the electrons that are flowing through the chain converts the oxygen into water. That water is wastewater and will be removed from the cell and exhaled from the body. The free energy that's produced by the movement of electrons through the electron transport chain is used by the members of the chain to pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space, maintaining the proton gradient across the membrane. Protons cannot move through the phospholipid bilayer, and the only way that protons can move back down that gradient across the membrane is through ATP synthase. The movement of protons through ATP synthase provides the free energy necessary to drive the production of ATP from ADP. And this is where most of the ATP in aerobically respiring organisms comes from. If you'd like to see this a little bit more in depth, here's a diagrammatic representation of the electron transport chain in the mitochondrial inner membrane. I wanna focus for a moment on the ATP synthase enzyme because I just think it's really, really cool. In the ATP synthase enzyme in the mitochondria, protons enter the enzyme in this region and the movement of those protons drives the catalytic activity that leads to the production of ATP from ADP in the other region of the enzyme. Looking at our accounting for oxidative phosphorylation, let's focus mostly on the ATP that's produced. The 10 NADHs are oxidized back to NAD+, and the energy from their electrons is used to generate approximately 30 ATP. The two FADH2s that enter are oxidized back into FAD, and the energy from them is used to generate approximately another 4 ATP. And of course, oxygen is reduced into water. Let's compare aerobic respiration with anaerobic respiration. In anaerobic respiration, we carried out glycolysis as the only ATP production mechanism, and we generated two net ATP. Aerobic respiration generates approximately 20 times more ATP, anywhere from 34 to 38 ATP molecules per the oxidation of one glucose molecule. That number is not a precise number, and it really can't be because the oxidation of glucose is not directly coupled to the production of ATP. The oxidation of glucose leads to the production of electron carriers, and it's the oxidation of those electron carriers at the electron transport chain that leads to the production of ATP. From an evolutionary perspective, aerobic cellular respiration evolves relatively late in the history of life on Earth. Aerobic cellular respiration evolves while life is still microscopic, but aerobic cellular respiration is the energetic key to the evolution of multicellular life on the planet. Without exception, every multicellular life form that you see on the planet, every animal, every plant, and every macroscopic fungi and protist exist because their cells generate a tremendous amount of ATP through the process of aerobic cellular respiration. 
Organisms that generate ATP solely through anaerobic cellular respiration cannot produce enough ATP to power the kinds of energetics needed in order to be multicellular. Before we wrap up, let's hit one classic misconception here at the end. It's important to understand that plants respire too. Plant-like eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. Photosynthesis stores energy in biological molecules, but plants still need to subject those molecules to cellular respiration in order to release the energy that's stored inside of them. If plants didn't respire, they wouldn't survive. Thanks so much for watching our video on aerobic cellular respiration. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how aerobic cellular respiration provides cellular energy. Make sure you can explain how and where each reactant and product in the aerobic respiration equation is used and produced. Make sure that you can explain how chemiosmosis functions in aerobic cellular respiration. And finally, make sure that you can compare and contrast the energetics of anaerobic and aerobic cellular respiration. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.